five, four, three, two, one. I'm John Miglosh for the Wisconsin DMA. We're going to have a meetup later in the month, so get ready for that. We have a golf outing planned for the end of June. We've got some big stuff coming, and I thank you for all that support. Okay. <coughs> Fishburn. We're starting with Fishburn because he did a, decided to do a cartoon this week. He missed last week. <coughs> I think we need to address your abandonment issues, which are serious issues, you know, if you lost a parent or something when you were little. Uh, but this is about cart abandonment, not about <laughs> not about baby abandonment. Uh, Braemard Institute reports 70% of all online shopping carts are abandoned. That's a pretty healthy percent. That's more than two-thirds. High cart abandonment rates are a headache for any marketer in charge of e-commerce sales. Yeah, and some of it's because, you know, you're doing the research in one channel and you switch over to another channel, right? So that's the case down here. This is funny. This pair is so perfect, I can't wait to buy them cheaper online somewhere. What's your Wi-Fi password? Yeah, that's right. Boy, is that ever true. Um... But it can also be unexpected shipping costs. A lot of times, you know, you have to go to the cart. You, you have no intention of buying it on that on the online channel, but you have to go to the cart in order to see what the shipping charges even are uh, or other extra charges. You know, now everybody's charging sales tax. Thanks. Thank you, Justice Kennedy. Uh, or a complicated checkout process, you know, where they, re, they, they make you do a CAPTCHA and then they make you... Put in your credit card by hand because they don't take PayPal or something. And uh, by the time you get done, you just get sick of it. Or requiring shoppers to set up a user account, et cetera. Or force them to use a certain payment method. Uh, so you can, you can work on that checkout design. I highly recommend ordering from yourself. Uh, fixing checkout issues, usability issues can boost conversion rates by 35%. Uh, and also retargeting with emails and with mail. Uh, Fishburn doesn't mention retargeting with mail, so we should have to we should have to update him. I'll have to send him a message on that one. Um, and uh, maybe because no expert mentioned it. Well, here I'm mentioning it. And especially if you have a high ticket item uh, that you you know you generally you just sell a high ticket item, uh, it's probably worthwhile. Somebody was sneaking peeks at the Masters. How about that, Masters? That was something. String of increasingly... <laughs> so Ben Davis, e-consultancy editor, Ben Davis said he was looking at some slippers, and then a couple days later he got a message that it was it was only 40 degrees outside. Only This was Celsius. Anyway, and uh, in Manchester, England, where Ben lived, and that was a great reason why he should get some slippers. <laughs> Probably is right. Automated personalization isn't always a good thing. If it's implemented sensitively, it if it isn't implemented sensitively, or you could have said, if it is implemented insensitively, it could jar. Nobody likes to feel they're like some giant sausage make in a giant sausage making machine being served a slightly sinister robot, being served by a slightly sinister robot butler. That Ben, he's a he's an alliteration fan, I gotta say. Okay, so here's that one we did. I posted our couch on Craigslist, and now Facebook is trying to sell it to me. Isn't that true? Wow, what a nice surprise this would have been if I had not been retargeted with ads for it since nonstop, for it nonstop since you shopped on our home computer. Oh, so the husband gets the wife uh, a, a sweater for Christmas, and he made the mistake of not shopping in a private browser. Okay, so that's enough. Here we go. Influencer editing. Reaction from the industry. Hannah Bowler. Okay, and this is from the drum. Uh, and, you know, some people said it was penalizing the influencers. That was me. I hope somebody got some inspiration from my talk last week. If And... And how is this right if traditional marketing doesn't abide by the same rules? Some excellent thoughts down here. Why do why do influencers think that they have to 
uh, at it, probably because they're a product of what of the industry they serve, right? Most of them are talking about glamour products, okay? Before penalizing influencers and telling them their beauty standards are different, we need to ensure they are truly, this is truly being ha happening across the board, right? So, so the manufacturer, the beauty, the beauty company is editing their, their photos, their modeling photos and editing their models and, uh, you know, fancy lighting, fancy everything. The influencer doesn't have any of that stuff. So they do a little bit of fixing a red eye. At what point does removing red eye or a minor skin blemish become image manipulation? Great question, right? Should virtual influencers, now they have, you know, talking robots that aren't even people. They're not edited. So somehow they're more authentic. And Grace Burton, the Omnichannel Content Coordinator at Loman and Rosher, said, as a grown woman, I'm compa I, I compared myself to filtered images and became upset. I can only imagine how young and impressionable girls are feeling. <coughs> the same institutions who made us feel inadequate, Gemma Dollar, this is excellent. The same institutions who made us feel inadequate are now saying they won't employ women who have discovered a way to present a visual present a visual of the perfection they've been sold. Right. Ogilvy won't work with anyone it has decided overstepped its imposed editing line, but other brands won't work with women because they're not perfect enough. Right. And in and it isn't just perfect. You know, my little niece was doing lots of modeling for Kohl's. And then all of a sudden wasn't getting calls. So my brother called up and said, why, why not? And they said, well, you know, she's white. You can, you can make those calls these days. And so she got banned because she didn't have the right look. And uh, although I would like to know what percentage of Cole's marketplace gem demographically is white, it would be an interesting question. On a similar note, 90% of marketers say it's getting harder to retain talent. Are you having this problem? That uh, This is by Chris Sutcliffe. Um, people are talking about the great resignation. What was interesting, and here my computer is going fuzzy again. In 2016, challenge churn was the high, fourth highest concern. 2018, it was third. Okay. And now, it's the number one concern. Maintaining talent. And this was the interesting part. Uh, most agencies didn't think that they had, their, their, their people met their current and media needs. And 80% um, of all respondents selected data as an area where additional capabilities would be required over the next two years. They're trying to hire people, data people, uh, followed by e-commerce and measurement. Mm, measurement, okay. And so if you're a direct marketer, you should be in demand. And if you're not in demand at your present place, you may want to you may, you may check out some other places because apparently they're looking for you, right? And that's the way it is. Okay. So anyway, good, good content today. I erased most of the articles I was going to talk about, so we're going to give you a short day today. Okay. There was a couple of direct mail ones. And there was, in, well, let's open one more because I know I wanted to talk about that testing one and I don't want to really ever talk about it again. Okay, fourth dimensions of performing A-B testing to increase email marketing ROI. Okay, this is from MarTech Plus. It's a new magazine that I've stumbled across and they seem to have a lot of related content. Okay, you want to, maybe you've done fair, uh, this was really good. If you're a growing company or already a large enterprise, how do you decide what's best for your customers or what are their preferences? How do you decide what is best for your customers? Because the best way is to listen to them, right? And how do you listen to them? Okay. Moreover, with the diversity in your target marketplace, understanding your customer's point of view can be difficult. Maybe you've done fair research to strategize customer-centric marketing campaigns, but how do you know, how do you know that what you think is right for your marketing campaign is actually working towards achieving your marketing goal. Well, with email marketing, you get the option to strategize more than one campaign and test all of them to select the one that works best for your organization. 
A-B testing. In other words, you test two things at once. When I try to teach testing to my friend Matt, uh, who just recently passed away, I suggested that, uh, or I asked him if golfer A, who shot a 73, was better than golfer B, who shot an 89. And he said, well, it depends. I said, like what? He said, like, are they on the same course? Is it the same day? He said, right. My best round ever was a 73, My and Jack Nicholas' worst PGA round was an 89, or maybe it was an 86. It was pretty bad, though. Um, and so one of the things about A-B testing is you want to try to get a head-to-head. -head. That's why teams switch ends. Uh, especially when they're playing outdoors, it matters a lot. Uh, they switch uh, uh, ends at halftime or at the quarter, and this makes uh, gives each team an equal exposure to the elements, to a wind direction and sun in their eyes and that sort of thing. Okay, so testing is the way to find out for sure. Testing, you can analyze which method of email marketing will gain, guarantee you the most noteworthy ROI. Now, there's a huge caveat in testing that none of these articles ever touch on. And that is that the way that the scientific method works, the way that it moves from, from past data into the future, is by, by observation of, of, an, of a fact or event, and then saying, I wonder what the cause of that is. We're always looking for causal factors. We're not just looking for constant conjunction of the effect. Okay, So we're looking for something that has a causal influence because a causal influence will repeat across time, right? It will, something, event will happen, and then in the future, the effect will happen. And so what we do is we hypothesize, and then on what, what the cause might be of this, of this observation, and then we test for that hypothesis. And we isolate, we try and neutralize all the other factors and just test for this one thing. So getting down into this, um, Kate says, Titles is the first thing you want to test in email. Now, there's something more important than titles. Kate, I want to tell you, you test the from. And you say, well, it's from you. Well, it can be from a lot of things. You know, we tested, we've tested the WDMA against just John Miglosh or John at the WDMA or a lot of things you can test. And I find that I look, I scan my emails first in the from column to see if there's anybody I recognize that I want to talk to. And that's why typically I pause on the, the ones that just have a first and last name because they look like they're from a person I know. Usually they're not, but that's where I start. And then I move over to the titles. So I would say first, before you test the subject line, test the from. The from may be the single most important thing. And even though you're a business, it might be more powerful to test a from from a person, from the CEO or from the sales manager or from the sales guy that you're used to talking to. All those things can matter, okay? Um, but the next thing is the title, the subject line. And as Craig Huey pointed out just a couple of days ago, um, a lot of times the email, what, whatever they're looking at, will truncate the title. So make sure the first two or three words matter because those are the ones that they may be the only ones that they can see. And Craig had excellent actual case studies of testing that they'd done with email. Be clear about what's in store for them in your email and what format the, of mentioning the information works best for you. I don't know what that means. Okay, content obviously is best, the next best. It says maybe your audience is a client toward video, ebooks, web journals, or infographics. You can't really embed much of that anymore these days. Everybody blocks it. So be sure to look at your email with everything blocked and, and see if there's enough content there for for any any uh, information to get through. Okay, I always test, my test emails never say always allow from John at WDMA. So I want to see what it looks like without the images live. Too few emails understand that. Okay, personalization, you can test personalized headlines. One of the interesting things I've seen lately is some people send out, you know, they may not have the fancy software to test to do A-B splits, but they, they send two, and they might be at the same time. 
I've seen a lot of times two of them sent at the very same time with two different subject lines, two different, uh, and and you know one will be more compelling. I'll click on one and I'll leave the other alone. And I wonder if that is what they're doing, it, because they don't have a you know a b the idea of a b split was that we do one label. You know we would literally take a stack of labels. It was a eight and a half, it was a 11 by 17 stack of printed out labels, and we cut them in half and set a half set on one machine and a half set on the other machine. And so basically every other piece would go from the mailing list, would get a different different mailing. Uh, and that's how AB came to, to be named, I believe. But anyway, you can send two at the same time and see which one gets a better open rate. Frequency, it's pretty hard to test. You know, the way you test that is over time and you have to have, you have, to have a good way of measuring the downstream profitability. So it's like a holdout test. So you say, well, we're going to mail this person once a day. We're going to mail this person once every or twice a week. We're going to mail this person once a week email and see what the net effect is in the next week or the next two weeks, something pretty quick time frame, and see what the profitability impact. And I would retest that over and over. I would continue to test that because you just never can get enough. So A-B testing makes your market strategy more customer driven and productive. And that's the real key in direct marketing. We want to let the market tell us what they're thinking. We don't want to assume that we know the best. We want to test it. Even when we think we know the best, we still want to test it because you'll learn something. And a lot of times you'll get surprises. It helps increase your open rates, conversion rates, enhances advertising efforts, improves hierarchical readiness and item quality. <clears throat> Thus, testing your emails and analyzing them before you're final, but you finalize on your market strategy. And I highly recommend reading Claude Hopkins' book, um, Unavailable, right? Call from Unavailable. I highly recommend Claude Hopkins' book, Scientific Advertising. And it's available for free at scientificadvertising.com, and I get no credit for that. But it tells you that the testing has been around since the 1850s, and the direct mailers are the ones who know what they're doing. Have a great day. Like and share. Your friends will know you're smart.